Hi, and we're about to start groundwater. We just finished Bluevial, so learning all about surface water. We'll continue our investigations into the freshwater resources on the planet for this section and chapter, also the next one in glaciers. But groundwater, wow, it's so important to us. And this map right here, it illustrates the groundwater resources around the world. And the blue colors represent major ones. And the green sections are complex ones. If you see a tanner color, that is the localized water resources that are under the ground. And I want to take a minute just to qualify that groundwater doesn't necessarily mean it's below the ground, but often is. And I'll illustrate that to you as we go through this section today. The point is, is groundwater is a very important resource worldwide. Certainly in the United States, we depend on it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. You look all the way down through Texas, Florida. Look at this big stretch of blue right there. You'll learn about that system called the Ogallala Aquifer. So we got to talk about groundwater versus surface water. Last time you learned there was something called surface water rights, and those are basically legal agreements for people who have purchased water or businesses, uh, agricultural operations, industry, whatnot. But before we even get into the difference of how those two types of waters, meaning groundwater and surface water, are owned or sold, we got to distinguish which one is in the ground, which one's on the surface, and why they're interrelated. Before we can even dive into the groundwater topics, we've really got to understand the difference between groundwater and surface water. So let me start with the easy one, surface water. That's the picture on the right that's going to the Sun Road and the river in Glacier National Park that follows that road. It's spectacular. That would be an example of surface water. Lakes, streams, rivers, ponds, playa lakes, things that you'll learn about in this course. However, groundwater is water that is captured in rocks. And I want to be careful to define what groundwater is because our immediate concept, the brain is going to take you that all groundwater is beneath the Earth's surface. And that's kind of what the definition of groundwater says in any major textbook. That is correct. It's just our perception of where the ground surface is needs to be adjusted. So groundwater is water that's captured in rock like you see on the left. This is obviously a model kind of showing what groundwater looks like. And not all groundwater is as easy as it looks here to get into rocks. However, it is within rock layers. It is water that has gotten between the poor spaces of clast. And you're going to learn about how important two very specific terms are to how groundwater functions in an aquifer, which is porosity and permeability. So what is an aquifer? These are systems that are water-bearing rock formations or layers or rock strata, and they contain porous rock that can actually bear water. And what I mean by bear water is they contain water. Aquifers take time to fill initially, and over geologic time, they have natural ways they recharge and discharge, and we'll get to that shortly. But it is important to point out that surface water, such as rivers, lakes, streams, and so forth, actually help add water to groundwater systems. And we'll get to that and how it works in just a second. Let's take a moment to talk about who owns what type of water. This matters, <laughs> and in Texas particularly. So let me give you the rundown of what the United States says. You learned in Fluvial that the United States owns water, surface water, that is basically all kinds of surface water. 
their definition for waters of the United States does not directly exclude groundwater. It's kind of a gray area. But in Texas, the definition for water and the Texas equivalent of the Clean Water Act basically says this, all surface water is owned by the state of Texas. So this matters because surface water involves rivers, straight streams, lakes, all the things that we could imagine that would have water at the surface. I'll tell you a few exclusions for surface water are diffuse surface water runoff during a rain event, any kind of water that's captured by rain, so rain harvesting. Maybe you have a stock pond. Most of those are all considered privately owned, but if you have a river, a, a lake, a tributary, a stream, a creek, <laughs> a playa lake, or even if you're along an area that receives tidal waters, that's still owned by the United States. And they give their water to individual states who's, who have the choice of how they deal with that. So water is sold by surface water rights. And that surface water rights is important to understand <laughs> because the surface water rights is a legal agreement. It is an actual contract that entitles the owner of that water to be able to depend on having it year in and year out, especially if they're long-term water rights, like very, very old ones. So they are purchased and they're purchased by the acre foot. We define that when we looked at fluvial systems, and I'll define it again. An acre foot is an acre of land filled with a foot of water. So how does groundwater compare? Basically, it works this way. In all the states but Texas, there's this thing called rule of capture. And that basically is a legal doctrine that gives the right of people to capture groundwater and use it. But remember, I told you that the Waters of the United States rule does not directly exclude groundwater. So Texas has its own version of this doctrine called right of capture. Essentially what it means is this. This is your house or your property, maybe it's your ranch, and you drill a water well on property you own. You can drill that down, and if there's an aquifer beneath that property, you can bring that groundwater up and use it for beneficial use. Things of beneficial use would qualify as drinking water, water for manufacturing, and irrigation for agriculture. So there's a few gray areas of what beneficial use could be, but there's even places in Texas that use it and discharge for things like water parks. <laughs> so that's getting a bit in the gray area, but nevertheless, it is right of capture. If you own the property, you can drill straight down and pull that groundwater up without asking permission. And in other states, you might actually have to ask for permission. So remember that all other states operate on rule of capture and the states may have a say in how that groundwater is used, especially in areas that have important groundwater resources that service large geographic areas or uh, let's say cities or even things like the Ogallala Aquifer for irrigation. So they can have conservation, uh, basically regulatory authority. But in Texas, it works different. Right of capture is the doctrine that is used here, and it's been around for over 100 years. And this right of capture allows people to drill down, just as I described, and use that for beneficial use. So let me give you a scenario of how this works. <laughs> Let's say that you're a homeowner and there's a big industry and you'll say you live out in the country and you would rely on groundwater. And there's an industry that's in or near your town that is pulling groundwater out of the same aquifer you are. They're pulling out so much aquifer because they're upstream of you, up, up dip, meaning they're going to be, if 
maybe they were where the tree were and this is where your property is. They drill out so much water that you can't get any out of the aquifer. That doesn't sound fair, does it? But that authority to them, they have that legal right in Texas. Let's couch it another way. Let's say that same entity pulls so much water out that it starts to damage your property. Literally, you start to have subsidence and maybe even a sinkhole develop. This becomes problematic. So right of capture, the only way that any kind of conservation can actually work in Texas is something that are called groundwater districts. They are not the same as regulating groundwater in Texas. They're just not. They are conservation districts. That's exactly what they are. So what I'm getting at is the Environmental Agency for Texas, which is Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, cannot regulate groundwater in Texas like they do surface waters because they regulate the surface water permitting program, everything about surface water. That is not the case in Texas. It might be the case in other states. So you need to know what those rules are where you live. When we're thinking about groundwater, groundwater holds a lot more freshwater resources than we see in rivers, lakes, and streams. And because of that, it's of great interest to humans because we need sources of water for municipal uses, such as drinking water and cooking and showering and, and flushing of toilets. But we also need groundwater for irrigation for crops and to water our livestock and water that's needed in industry and manufacturing. That is why we're very interested in groundwater. So groundwater tends to be more plentiful in rock layers that are closer to the surface as compared to rocks that are deeply buried under, let's say, thousands of feet of sedimentary or igneous or metamorphic rocks above them. And the reason for that is the less burial, the less compaction of pore spaces. So I'll use the example of a trash can. Let's say that you get charged by your city for having more than one trash can. <laughs> you might stomp on your trash, or even in your home, you may want to just only have to use one trash bag. So you stomp on it to get all the extra air space out so you can get more trash in there. Well, essentially, that's what happens as rock layers get piled one on top of the other. And this can definitely squeeze out the spaces that are used to house groundwater in aquifers. Having said that, there are aquifers that we can drill down to that are thousands of feet beneath the Earth's surface. And so I just I want to be clear about that. They're harder to get to and obviously more expensive to drill down to. This is a shot of Glacier National Park. And while there is snow melt from glaciers nearby, what's happening is there's natural springs that are coming out of the wall face of this rock formation. And it runs almost 24 seven. It may stop running if the conditions really warm up or recharge stops in this area from snow melt. Because the snow melt helps recharge the groundwater system pretty quick out here. But you see this and this is why I wanted to point out it's not necessarily beneath your feet that groundwater exists. When you see something like this, your paradigm of thinking, oh, groundwater is just beneath my feet changes because you realize, okay, it can be in rock layers anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be beneath my feet as I'm walking. So this is a great example of groundwater, and these are springs, but it's groundwater that I think people can relate to better than those that are in aquifers beneath our feet because we can't see them. We can see this, but we can't really see the aquifers that are buried beneath the Earth's surface. So why is groundwater so important? Well, it constitutes 12% of freshwater resources. So on 
across the globe, you're looking at just a tiny percent of all water on the planet. One to two percent is fresh water. And of that, rivers, lakes, and streams make up a whopping one percent. So you compare the one percent of rivers, lakes, and streams, which is surface water, to the plentifulness of groundwater, which is 12 percent. That's 12 times the amount of water. <laughs> and in addition, over half of Americans rely on it as their primary drinking water resource. In Texas, that number is even higher, 57%. Because it's basically rural communities. And I might even add some townships and cities, they drill for groundwater for, and treat it and give it as public water drinking supplies. So it is very possible that your city may pull groundwater, blend it with some surface water, or exclusively use groundwater, depending on where they're located. That's why we really care about groundwater is because there's a lot of it, and it is an important resource for consumption. In order for groundwater to work, a few things must be present. And there are four things, to be exact. These characteristics work together to make an aquifer usable and function in an aquifer system, not just for humans, but also just in nature. you got to have recharge, you need porosity and permeability, and then you have to have a way for that groundwater to get out of the ground, which is called discharge. So if you look at the diagram here, you can see the raindrops and the R stands for runoff. The I stands for infiltration. I might add that when you have a root zone like this tree, water will infiltrate like where these red arrows are beneath that via percolation. And we'll get to that in just a second. So groundwater can't have recharge without percolation. So I'd equate each of these things as necessary for how you operate your life, even your cell phones, your computers, your bank accounts. You've got to have recharge for these things to work, right? Then you've got to have some infrastructure, like on your computers and your cell phones, maybe apps or uh, electricity to charge it up, things like that. And then you need a way when it to get that information out. So maybe that would be texting, just giving you an example of how this might correlate to something in your life. Groundwater has to recharge in an aquifer. This is a good cell phone example here. We've all either had a computer or a cell phone die on us because the battery runs too low. Groundwater, when its battery runs too low, it's essentially the water in the aquifer is depleted or gets below the water table. So that's why we need to have recharge. And the recharge comes from usually surface water runoff or discharges from rivers and other forms of surface water that can percolate beneath the root zone into the subsurface and find its way in between pore spaces of rock, sometimes even in a cavern. But how is percolation different from infiltration? Infiltration just allows water to get right to the root zone. But when you start to get water well beneath the root zone of plants, that's called percolation. There are percolating coffee pots. You sometimes see these at estate sales uh, that are the only kinds of coffee pots that existed for decades. I can remember my mom making coffee for my dad in a percolating coffee pot before automatic coffee pots became a thing. <laughs> and percolating coffee, man, it's yummy. It's good. And it's because it has time to water to drain through the different grains and make a rich, nice flavor to that particular coffee. Well, I'm going to equate that to the size grains and rocks. So when I first started on my own and living on my own, starting to make my own coffee, my first adventure on doing coffee grounds, where you actually went to the store and you ground up your coffee grounds there, I got real industrious and didn't, you know, I tried to make different numbers. And so I bought these bags of coffee and I did wine on 
one bag on the lowest number, which was one, and I did another bag on 10, so it was like flour. <laughs> one had big grains. <laughs> they weren't coffee beans, but they were pretty big grains like clast, almost like sand size. <laughs> and then my number 10 was the opposite, it was so fine grain. So the difference in the coffee was that the bigger grain coffee, the water drained faster through it. Well, that's gonna be similar to permeability. <laughs> and when you have something like porosity, it'd be like the 10, because the water took a long time to work its way through those coffee grounds. So as we talk about groundwater and the items that are required to make it work, I wanted to give you that analogy as we start into this conversation. But percolation is, again, that groundwater that gets beneath the root zones of plants and can get into rock layers and make aquifers. Reach charge rates are not the same all over the planet. Unfortunately, as climate temperature is rising, this also affects the ability of groundwater systems to be recharged. This is where the climate conversation and the surface water uh, issues we talked about in fluvial, they intersect, directly correlated. So the yellows and the oranges, you can see those areas are having more difficulties and you kind of can see a trend, right? And you can also notice that in the Arctic areas, there's problematic systems as well. But I want you to concentrate on the west and the southwest of the United States, and even Texas for that matter. And you can see that recharge rates are uh, having some issues. And I might point out that the Ogallala Aquifer right in here, which is responsible for all of our irrigation and majority of the crops we grow, has issues as well. You'll get other continents and you can begin to see a, a trend. This is a worldwide problem. And since groundwater has been providing 12% of the freshwater resources around the world, as we're having recharge problems, that percentage is going to decline unless the climate changes. There are a few terms you gotta know before we can talk about porosity and permeability. The first is water table. Water table is when the surface water percolates into the subsurface below the root zone until it encounters what we call the water table in an aquifer. The water table is dependent directly on the amount of recharge that an aquifer receives. So in a very wet year, you would get the water table rising. So the water table is basically the saturated zone of a groundwater system known as an aquifer. And the unsaturated zone could potentially have water if you get a really wet year and it's, and it's a, a type of aquifer where water can rise and fall called an unconfined aquifer. So the water table is the normal line or boundary in an aquifer that stays wet most of the time. So just think with me hypothetically, if we're gonna drill, let's say we're gonna put a house near this tree and we wanna use the groundwater. I can't drill just down to where it says capillary fringe. I have to drill down to where the water table is. And if I were a little smarter, I might drill down maybe halfway down into the water table in case we had a drought year and the water table dropped. So let's talk about the zones of aquifers. There are two major zones, the saturated zone and the unsaturated zone. And then we'll talk about the zone of variation, which is in the middle <laughs> between them. As I mentioned, the saturated zone is basically the water table and it represents the pore spaces and void spaces within a rock material, a rock layer, and the fractures that are in the ground and those rock layers that get soaked with water. It's important that you realize it's not as simple as it sounds. Nature takes a while to do this. Some aquifers can recharge within minutes and hours, but when we're talking about regular sandstones and you know siltstones and limestones that aren't karsted, things that are pretty tough rock for water to get through, this takes can be hundreds and thousands of years for this to occur. And the amount of pressure that builds up in these aquifers, it's hard for humans to duplicate that. 
because your mind might already be going to, well, how could we artificially do this? How could we manufacture groundwater? And it's, it's a logical and good thought process to think about. The unsaturated zone is that part of an aquifer that does not bear water unless you have a super wet year, right? You have excess recharge. The zone of variation exists between them. And this area, while it sounds obvious, it has some pore spaces with air that can fill up with water. This is important because it can help suck up water towards the surface via something called capillary fringe. So the zone of aeration represents the boundary between the saturated and unsaturated zones. While that seems so obvious, that's an important section of an aquifer. And let's talk about why. The zone of aeration represents the area of an aquifer that contains both air and water within the pore and void spaces of that aquifer system, meaning the sediments and the rocks. So this zone can actually suck up groundwater from the saturated zone from something called capillary fringe. And if you look at the tree roots on this one, this diagram, this is an important reason why capillary fringe helps nature in general. Certain types of plants and trees will literally grow their root systems down towards an area of the zone of aeration where they can suck up water via capillary friends to help stay alive. So this zone plays a real important role in keeping things alive at the surface. So if you have trees in your yard, certain trees compete more for water. So if you have a bunch of mesquite type trees, uh, they're going to use a lot more water than an oak tree. So you may want to consider that when you're purchasing property, if you're trying to grow certain trees or want to keep certain trees, they may be competing for the same groundwater if indeed you have that on your property or beneath your property. So there's something that we need to talk about that matters as we start to talk about recharge in a second, and that's the contributing zone. So you're like, okay, we learned about the saturated zone, the unsaturated zone, the zone of aeration. What's the contributing zone? I'd like you to shift gears from thinking about underground to thinking about the Earth's surface. And when we have rain events, anything that's pollution-based can wash off in that water and end up percolating or making even a nosedive, depending if you're in a karsted area, for example, in the Edwards Aquifer in Austin or San Antonio area, anywhere in between, <laughs> those pollutants will get into groundwater. So in Texas, since we can't regulate, meaning the state of Texas, TCEQ, they cannot regulate groundwater. They can certainly regulate the pollution in the contributing zone, at the surface that could impact aquifers such as the Edwards aquifer. So the Edwards aquifer right now is the only one that has designated rules in the Texas Administrative Code for protection. And the way it's protected is by controlling construction activities, controlling pollution via best management practices to prevent things like this oil, to prevent all this sediment and any other kind of pollutants entering into a recharge zone. So essentially the contributing zone could be the surfaces of parking lots and construction sites and just your basic ground and stormwater conveyance systems where they can enter the ground and percolate down into a groundwater system. Well that brings us to recharge zones. <laughs> so the contributing zones on the earth's surface, the recharge zone is beneath the earth's surface. This is why we want to protect and reduce pollution at the surface in the contributing zone. We don't want that pollution in the recharge zone. Once the surface water runoff or other sources of water enter the ground and they percolate through rock layers, that water will eventually reach a recharge zone. And when it does, this zone is the area of an aquifer that replenishes, like recharging your phone, it replenishes the water supply there. But just going back to the pollution example from the contributing zone, what if I had some really nasty chemicals 
or worse, biological uh, contaminants such as pathogens? What if I had leaking underground petroleum storage tanks, the stuff that holds the, the fossil fuels that you put in your car, leaking underground that contain known carcinogens for, he's, for humans, like benzene? <laughs> These are considerations that we want to care about for the recharge zone because the recharge zone is typically where that water is going to get in an aquifer and then ultimately it will be sucked out or discharged either as a spring or sucked out by a well that people drill. So that recharge comes into the system via percolation and in whatever quality of water came from the contributing zone will go through the rock material and end up in the aquifer system. I need to take a moment and say some sediments are better than others in terms of helping to clean and uh, if you want to, for better lack of words, uh, do a little house cleaning on your water as it's going into an aquifer. But we can't remove all contaminants in the ground and it's just the way it is. In order to protect that groundwater resource that we have coming into the recharge zone, that's why the federal government requires that stormwater runoff, sources of it, from businesses like construction, certain industries, and even uh, cities that have municipal separate storm sewer systems called MS4s. So you're like, oh, what's that? Basically stormwater drains. <laughs> Every one of these entities are regulated by law to help reduce the amount of pollutants that run off because they never get treated at a wastewater treatment plant. So the federal government and subsequently the states have passed laws for stormwater and they require that BMPs, known as best management practices, be installed to help reduce pollution. And an example is on the right. Can you see this rock berm and then how this grass is growing and these geotextiles here were, that were impregnated with seeds. This is an example of trying to stabilize a construction site to reduce the contaminants that would wash off into rivers, lakes, and streams and or groundwater. Because remember, we're trying to prevent pollution from percolating down into the water table and ultimately into the recharge zone. So let's talk about groundwater availability. Most sedimentary rocks on average have about 20% porosity, allowing for water to be stored in rocks. You can test this uh, theory and hypothesis by picking a rock off, off, uh, off the ground in your yard and putting it in a Ziploc bag for a couple of days and you'll get condensation inside of it. And that's because there's water in the pore spaces of rocks, most rocks that is. The amount of porosity and I might add permeability in rock layers determine the volume, availability, and the strength of movement of groundwater in a rock. So this is a sponge, and this is a good look at how we show porosity and permeability. So porosity, pore spaces in rocks that can hold water. Permeability is the interconnectedness of pore spaces that allows water to travel between pore spaces. You gotta have both for a groundwater system to work. So porosity represents how much water can be stored in the pore and void space. Don't confuse that with permeability. So we'll get to that in a minute. So the percentage of porosity varies on a couple of things. The size of class you have and how well they're compacted together. So soil in general has a really high porosity because it's not been smushed, right? It's got a lot of air. <laughs> Shale, mudstone, and siltstone tends to have the highest percentage of porosity and smaller grain sizes. Sandstone has 30 to 50 percent porosity and fractured basalt and granites, they have different varying amounts. You can see basalt has up to 40 because you can get something like vesicular basalt, but fractured granite only has up to 10 percent porosity. And you think about granite and those interlocking crystals, that phaneritic texture, that makes good sense, right? When we're thinking about the rocks that would have higher porosity, you could see how larger grained sediments with larger clast in particular could have higher porosity. But it's the finer grained sediments 
like siltstones and shales that can store water exceptionally well. I might point out that that's one reason that they are used in pottery, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Highly cemented rocks, meaning there's maybe a lot of calcite or some other type of cementation within the rock, those are going to have very low porosity. Subsequently, also water won't flow well through it, which is permeability. So that brings us to permeability. So now that you know that porosity is the void space in rocks that can hold water, how is it different from permeability? It's very different. Here's how. Because permeability describes the interconnectedness of pore spaces. That's a key word, interconnected pore spaces. Basically, if you look at this diagram, you can see here's pore spaces, but do you see the travel path as these arrows are allowing water to move in between these class? Each time we're getting a smaller class, but you can see a travel path because the pore spaces are connected well enough that water can move through aquifer material. So that means it's easier to get the water out of the rock. So we need both for an aquifer to work. But for human consumption, permeability is really important for extraction or discharge of groundwater. So I want you to watch this animation on the right and compare it to the diagram on the left. And can you see how permeability allows those pore spaces to be connected for water to flow through? And I might point out as it's showing it again, you can see some pore spaces just aren't well connected, like up here and along the sides. While they could store water, they're not going to allow that water to travel through the aquifer system. That means that you would have water stuck in that aquifer. So the areas that are well connected to permeability, the water can penetrate and travel through the, the void spaces of a rock. When you start to look at them together, let's look at on the left, you see rock spaces that or rock material that has no spaces at all. So it'd be low in porosity and permeability. But when we see the unconnected pore spaces, that's gonna be indicative of porosity. So I can store water. Here's some water stored between these class that's blue. But when you see this last section of the diagram on the right, can you see how this is all interconnected? Well, that interconnected pore spaces represents permeability. So you can see how the two are absolutely necessary to make groundwater systems work. So that brings us to the last part of the four requirements. Remember the first one was recharge, the second one was porosity, the third was permeability, and last but not least, we must have discharge for a groundwater system to operate properly. Groundwater exits the ground via several different ways. One through springs, the other through seeps, and last but not least, wells. So sometimes wells are human uh, made, or we can find natural openings of springs and put a well on top of it. But the two, the left in the middle, the two pictures that are not human related, these are naturally occurring sources of discharge. We can artificially discharge by using pumps and drilling them. There's a problem with that. You can see if we drill and pump out too much water and don't get enough free charge. So it'd be like you use your phone too much and you don't have a, a charging cord and you're like, what am I going to do? <laughs> it runs out of juice and goes dead on you. There's nothing you can do until you finally get to a charging station. Well, groundwater works exactly the same way with recharge. So that brings me to the natural discharge options that we have for getting water out of the ground. The first one is springs. Some springs bubble up from the earth, meaning from the uh, ground surface, and I'll show you one, a short little video clip in a minute. And then you will see here, you can actually see a discharge from, from a rock on the side of a rock formation where water is falling out of the ground, much like I showed you with the Weeping Wall in Glacier National Park. But springs happen because groundwater naturally flows, and when it comes to the surface, it, the way it does that is by intersecting 
the water table with the land surface and the water will find an exit point. So where that water table and land intersect, you should see discharge of some form. So that's a spring. Here's that weeping wall again, another shot of it in Glacier National Park. And you can clearly see how that's coming out of those rock formations there. And it's, it's gorgeous, right? Not all springs are as big as this one, but this is a really good indicator of how natural discharge can work. This is an example of a natural flowing spring in Indian Springs Park near the suspension bridge in Waco and water is bubbling up to the surface adding into the Brazos River. This is simply an example of groundwater discharge. Let's show you a seep now. This is the second type of natural discharge and when groundwater seeps out of the ground it doesn't flow but it oozes. It almost looks like the ground is crying. <laughs> so the, it's a slower movement of water and it comes through a porous substance. So this is the Edwards limestone and this section is what we're going to zoom in right here. And I want you to see how wet this section is. Well when you look at right in here, that's this section right here, you can see vegetation that wouldn't normally be there. It's because the seep is providing the water resource, which is a natural discharge point. It's just not flowing. So it's possible that a seep could start to flow, obviously, as a spring, if you have excessive discharge or a new, a new way for water to exit becomes bigger and it starts to flow rather than just kind of seep out. But springs and seeps are related, but seeps you can really be looking for just the oozing of water out of rock. This is a good example of seeps that came out in Zion National Park. And you can see where the chemical weathering has occurred, but actually these are wet spots right here. And these wet spots are draining out of the sandstone with the Navajo sandstone and creating seeps which actually help provide for the water for this vegetation right here. So natural discharge, either it's going to happen by springs or seeps. There's still a third type of natural discharge, and it's a type of spring, actually. It's called an artesian spring, and I'm going to also include a well. So artesian is a term that refers to a special type of confined aquifer, which you'll learn about a little later. But when groundwater flows under its own pressure and then is sandwiched between two aquitards, which is a confining rock layer. So here's a confining uh, rock layer here known as an aquitard. This other gray layer right here is an aquitard. The water smushed in between them. When it finds an opening, it can literally flow under its own pressure. So we call that an artesian well. And artesian wells and springs, folks, that just means it was water between two aquitards. So aquitards are an important term you need to know. They represent confining rock layers. Oftentimes they can be bedrock or shale. Shale is a fabulous aquitard. Another reason why many landfills uh, used rock-like shale as part of their required liner so landfills are required to put some kind of liner beneath where they put trash in the ground. And most of them use a clay layer or two <laughs> in addition to some pretty expensive type of lining material. It's because it's a great aquitard. It's aquitard just as that. It is water restricting material. Tard to slow down, aqua for water. So it's a rock layer that slows down the flow of water. So an artesian spring is simply one that bubbles under its own pressure. This is an artesian aquifer and you can see it's a spring. They just put a casing on it because people can use these. So you can see how it's bubbling under its own weight. These are great for humans because we don't have to put a big pump system in, an expensive one, to try to extract that from the ground. Having said that, you allow too much to be used or if you do put a pump on one of these, eventually you could drop the water table and it's no longer going to flow under its own pressure. Which brings me to a topic of interest, which is bottled water. So if you're like, how does bottled water get in this conversation? A lot of bottled water is 
spring water. Some is artesian, which is still spring water. And then the rest of it's purified. So I would like to discuss the three and tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> First of all, the bottled water world is not regulated by the State Drinking Water Act. Subsequently, the state of Texas, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, does not regulate the water quality of bottled water. Now, the packaging is regulated by USDA. So I want to tell you the difference between the three major kinds, and I put three just bottles of water just because there was some you'll recognize and one that's generic. So the Ozarka is spring water and if you look at the packaging be very careful when you're buying bottled water to read the packaging. Ozarka water is just spring water that comes out of a groundwater spring. Pretty cute label right? Nice label. Artesian water or water that comes out of two aquitards. <laughs> comes out of confined aquifer, like an artesian well. And then purified water typically comes from the tap. It means somebody just put the water on, <laughs> maybe ran it through an additional filtration system to make it taste better. And likely all three of these have been run through some kind of filtration system to add to the aesthetic pleasing, not just visually, but also taste to remove some of the extraneous minerals that can make water taste funny. Of these three, the only one that I would say you can guarantee a majority of the time that it is going to at least be to drinking water standards would be purified because purified comes from the tap. And tap water in the United States is required to meet the Safe Drinking Water Act standards. So I'll tell you a quick story about artesian water versus purified water. So I was in Alaska and we were going to take a whale watching animal watching and fjord tour on a boat so it was one of our excursions and it was pouring down rain it was in Ketchikan Alaska and the drinks on the boat even water were just cost prohibitive so people were buying water and candy bars and stuff in this shop before we got on the boat and there was an older couple who was standing the two of them at the water area, they were refrigerated, and the old man had picked up one of these. So he's probably in his 80s, okay, because he's about the same age as my dad at the time. And the woman had picked up one like this, but it had a really gorgeous label on it. And it looked like it was mountainous, it said artesian. I mean, the label was gorgeous. Just as a souvenir, it was cute. His bottle was a little over a dollar. Hers was five dollars. She was convinced because of the pretty label and the word artesian that her water was better than what he was. And he was complaining that she was spending too much money. I mean, you can almost see this going down, right? So the people I are with, they knew I was a geologist. And like, are you going to say anything? And I'm like, well, um, no. <laughs> and they overheard us. And so the lady goes, I want to know. And the old man was looking for justification for why they should buy this purified water. So I explained to them what artesian well was. And I'll do it for you too, the artesian water. You have an aquitard on the bottom, an aquitard on the top. Water gets sandwiched beneath them. And where an exit point is, it goes sprays up at the surface. And then the bottled water that was purified came out of the tap. So the man's wife, all disgusted, puts her artesian bottle back, grabs two bottles of the purified water and heads to the cash register. The old man comes and gives me a big hug. He was so validated. <laughs> I'm not saying there was anything wrong with her artesian water, but she was kind of being snookered by the fact that the label was a bit misleading. She was thinking she was buying something really beautiful and clean because of the packaging. So I would encourage you to know more about packaging and look at where bottled water is actually put in the store and also look at where the brand names are. They pay for eye level 
sections of the store to get things sold more. There is a rhyme and a reason to that. So I will tell you a story about Ozarka. Ozarka originally started in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. And there's a, a story behind this where some of the Native Americans, a story about a princess who had poor eyesight and her dad, her chief, had heard that this was good water, healing water, and put it on her eyes and she could see. So this man had a similar situation, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years later, and started selling and bottling bottled water for the first time as a commodity. And it was a home run. I mean, it was a grand slam, really. People started buying it. So eventually, they decided to move to Texas, and I'd ask you to think about why. Right of capture. They bought some land, drilled uh, some wells into the aquifer system that they were pulling out of in East Texas and began to pull their water there. So Ozarka is no longer in Arkansas. It pulls its groundwater from Texas. And there's a direct correlation to write a capture as to why they chose Texas. We can artificially discharge. And remember the natural discharges were springs, seeps, artesian springs. Now we're looking at artificial discharge where humans do this. So water wells can look as simple as this or the complex one I showed you earlier, but the goal is to drill down to the water table and bring it up. You're hoping that you can find an artesian well that has some pressure that would allow you to not have to spend so much on electricity to pump that water up. But most wells do require some form of pumping to get it to the surface. When we think about artificial discharge, the well's depth, they matter. Most wells are dug to about 300 feet, simply because it's expensive to drill deeper. Of course, modern day uh, drilling, especially when you think of fracking, they're even using groundwater and in their situation and surface water in that operation. But you can see wells drilled to several thousand feet, and there are even some in central Texas in the Trinity Aquifer that are about 2,000 feet deep. But in terms of the depth, that kind of correlates with the layers of rock that get, as layers keep getting on top of older layers, they're squishing out that space where you can hold more water. So the water that's in these aquifers that are deeper tend to be more compressed. So the 300-foot markers where most of our wells in Texas and throughout the United States are drilled, not all. So we're thinking about the two groups of aquifers. There's major and minor. Majors serve large geographic areas, cities, large irrigation needs, manufacturing. There are nine of them in Texas. The one, the blue one's really important because it's the southerly extent of the Ogallala. This green kind of lime green and candy striped area that is going to uh, be your Trinity, which is what services the Waco and surrounding areas. This section over here is going to be your Edwards, and I might point out that the Edwards and Trinity and certain sections intersect. And then you have the Carrizo Wilcox over here, and then this Gulf Coast one is a very substantial aquifer system. So groundwater is a big deal in these major aquifers. Minor aquifers are the second major group of aquifers. These provide smaller volumes of water. They can be over large areas or small geographic areas and a bunch of water for that small geographic area. But there are 20 of them. There's a correlation to these, and I want you to be thinking about it. This is like the Llano Uplift area or Enchanted Rock, but you can see they don't provide nearly as big a volume of water as major aquifers, but we care about them because they still provide groundwater resources, especially as you start moving to western parts of Texas where there's less water altogether. So when you look at them side by side, I might point out that especially on the major aquifers section, there's a rhyme and a reason to why the, to the long sections, linear lines of these things look like the yellow and the reds and the greens. These are correlated to ancient transgressions and regressions. So the sediments that got laid down, you, these can represent sea level and the rocks that make them up. So 
They could be shoreline rocks, they could be marine rocks like limestone, but they correlate to that. The exception to the rule is this one up here. That's the Ogallala Aquifer created by a different way. Speaking of the Ogallala Aquifer, this is referred to as the High Plains Aquifer System, but in short, people call it the Ogallala Aquifer. It covers eight states, and the biggest part of it, or the most voluminous section is actually in Nebraska and that's where the name Ogallala comes from because there's a township or a city by that name. Ogallala, kind of a fun name. But it was formed from fluvial deposition created the sediments and I would say the further north you go you could also have glaciated sediments that came from the melting of the last ice age. But most of the materials came down from the last 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago. And I also might add the melting of the ice packs of the last ice age could have helped easily recharge this thing as well as it did before humans really started using it the way we are now. Its primary use is irrigation. And I want you to look at this and I will show you a small video clip of what it looks like in the Ogallala Aquifer. And during growing season, it's 24 seven. Welcome to the Ogallala Aquifer. This aquifer covers portions of eight states from South Dakota all the way to the panhandle of Texas uh, in Amarillo. This is important because irrigation for agriculture is the primary use of how the Ogallala is utilized. You have to imagine that 24-7 during growing season, this is what's happening all over the aquifer system. Right at capture is not the way that we can regulate water in, in uh, anywhere else but Texas for groundwater. So you have to imagine that they can have conservation laws in the other seven states for this use, but Texas does not. And this is important because this particular aquifer system is being depleted fairly rapidly. The Texas Panhandle is an important user of the Ogallala Aquifer, especially for the large beef farms that exist in that part of the state that need water. The Ogallala Aquifer is declining at a rate of 1.75 feet per year, which means you need to think about how long that Ogallala Aquifer could last and how this could impact us in the future. Now keep in mind, right of capture in Texas allows Texans to use groundwater if they own the property. These other states can have conservation measures put in because they only have rule of capture. Unfortunately, the Ogallala Aquifer is in trouble. And remind you, it's what irrigates a majority of the Midwest, which grows a lot of the crops that we use in the United States. It's declining its water table at a rate of 1.75 feet per year in the water table. That number is important enough for you to know. When you look at this map, you can see that some of the biggest problems are where the heaviest users are. And you might wonder why Texas has such a high concentration. Well, up in the panhandle, there's a lot of beef operations known as concentrated animal feeding operations, specifically uh, beef lots. So, and we're talking like thousands of head of cattle, tens of thousands. And then you can see where the irrigation is, but what you're noticing is Texas has the worst problem. And the reason is right of capture. The other states have some conservation efforts in place, but we can't do that in Texas because of right of capture. So if you haven't taken a break, maybe you can put me on pause, go take your break, get a good beverage and a snack and come back ready to learn about the three different types of aquifers and then we'll move into car systems and how all this fits together. There are three major types of aquifers and every single one of them has at least one aquitard, which is a confining rock layer if you recall. So all of them have an aquitard at the bottom, but the type varies if it has an aquitard also on the top or a little bitty aquitard at the bottom. All these things matter. So I'm going to go through all three types and we'll talk about how they work. Unconfined aquifers are those that have an aquitard at the bottom, but not one at the top. So water is free to rise and fall in the water table based on the amount of recharge that's received in an area. 
So when you look at this, this is the unconfined aquifer at the surface here, but here's your confining layer, which is the aquitard. So let's say we have a very wet year. This could spill out naturally via springs or even wells and flood out this property. But if we have a very wet year, a drought years, or a series of them, let's say a couple of decades, like we've been having out west, these water tables are going to naturally decline by even natural discharge and even faster if we have artificial discharge, which would be human wells like this one. So I want to point out that in unconfined aquifer, the water table can rise and fall because there's no aquitard on the top. The difference between that and a confined aquifer, the confined aquifer has an aquitard on the bottom and an aquitard on the top. This allows water to sandwich between those two aquitards and it tends to be more compressed, uh, meaning the water in the water table as compared to what we see in an unconfined aquifer. Now, if you get a confined aquifer that can flow under its own weight, meaning its own pressure, and it can come up to the surface, it can spray up to the surface. That's called an artesian aquifer. So it's a special type of confined aquifers. Not all confined aquifers are artesian. So in this case, you see an aquitard here and one in here. I might add the recharge zones way up here. So the water is coming down, 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 down. Great place to put your well if you were going to drill here for this well would be way down here where the pressure is the greatest and you would probably have an artesian well in this case and that's exactly what it is but if I drilled way up here the pressure is not built up enough so you it matters where you put a well in an artesian system but again not all confined aquifers are artesian wells but they are a special type there's still a third type it's the smallest it's called a perched aquifer a perched aquifer can have a tiny little uh, aquitard, sometimes above a major aquifer system, like some kind of unconfined or confined aquifer system, but it's just a small little aquitard with a little water collection at the surface. Perched aquifers tend to be close to the Earth's surface and can produce good springs and or seeps even, but are important for providing freshwater resources and nature for wildlife. So this would not be the right choice for using for human consumption because you're just not going to have enough for use long term. So what kind of aquifer is this? It's close to the surface, has a small tiny little aquitard. That would be a perched aquifer. When you see, and I'll be very clear, this is an aquitard, be clay. So this water table is free to rise and fall. What kind of aquifer would that be? Is it unconfined or is it confined? Or is it artesian? Which one is it? If it doesn't have an aquitard at the top, it's unconfined. But you have an aquitard here, and here's your bedrock, which would also be an aquitard. And notice that this water is flowing under its own pressure. That's a special type of confined aquifer. What is it called? An artesian one. So what kind of aquifer is this? The water table is free to rise and fall. There's no aquitard at the top. That house could be at risk of flooding during a high recharge year. You guessed it, it is a unconfined aquifer. Well, that brings us into karst systems. I want to show you this and let you look at it and see that the limestone has been hollowed out some of that could be differential weathering, but karst systems are formed from things like limestone and dolostone that have been karsted out, and predominantly limestone. So this kind of landscape could exist beneath the Earth's surface, allowing for very special things to occur under the ground. Why are karst systems such a big deal? So when you start to look at the darker blue areas, these areas have extensive karst systems. The areas that have red, these are actually karst systems that are created for, from volcanic rock and I want to tell you that's not true karsting, it's just groundwater that's percolated in from things like basalt and those types of rocks. But when you see like in Texas, you're looking at limestone here. Lots of it in Florida as well. So 
just looking at this map, wherever you see the blue, that means you're going to probably have a lot of limestone. And that means oceans once covered a majority of North America several times in geologic past. So if you sign up for historical, then you can learn all about when these different sea level rises happened. So karst systems are underground drainage systems. So what happens is dissolution of limestone by carbonic acid slowly but surely works its way through joints and fractures and begins to eat away the fabric of rock. And over time it can create extensive cavern systems. Other times it can just make holes in rocks like karst limestone. So on the left is karst limestone, on the right is karst limestone, but carbonate rocks that come in contact with slightly acidic rainwater will combine with that and it makes a weak carbonic acid which slowly dissolves away the fabric of the limestone rock. And when it does, it creates holes just like this. This is karst limestone right there. So one of the most prolific karst systems and I might add protected systems, remember we don't regulate groundwater in Texas, it's the Edwards Aquifer and that is in Texas. You're like, well that contradicts what you said. No, it doesn't because we regulate what happens in the contributing zone, if you recall learning about the contributing zone. The pollution at the surface is what we care about. So this aquifer has the protection of state law, specifically the Texas Administrative Code, and it requires best management practices, BMPs, to reduce pollution getting into the recharge zone. And the reason is it's Edwards is used as the primary drinking water resources for most cities and almost the exclusive drinking water resource for the city of San Antonio. One thing that's important to know about the Edwards is that it's like 75 to 80 percent fractured. And since it's so fractured up, this is what it looks like under the surface, there's a lot of capabilities for water to get into it. And this is important because that means water can literally disappear if it's flowing at the surface and dive in as a stream, which is called a disappearing stream. Since it is the sole drinking water resource for San Antonio, the quality of this water matters and the recharge in the Edwards is pretty fast. So if it doesn't it get treated uh, quickly or you have pollution that can't be treated, this could be dangerous for the people who consume it. I also have to tell you there's some endangered creatures that live in the Edwards Aquifer Caverns <laughs> and they are protected by the Endangered Species Act. So you might wonder why is it so fractured? Why is it so uh, broken up? It has to do with the area, the Edwards Plateau getting uplifted. And when that happened by faulting, and that's very much more modern in geologic time as compared to when these rocks were made in the late Cretaceous period. But as it uplifted, it put a tremendous amount of pressure on these rocks and fractured them. So the fractures in the joints allowed for this carbonic acid to be eating it away. So this is a cross-cutting relationship for principles of geology to understand that the eating away of the limestone, the karsting, is much newer than the limestone itself. So that brings us to learning about several different karst systems. Sinkholes are one that you probably heard a lot about. They are depressions in the ground that form when soluble rock dissolves, causing a cave ceiling to collapse. And when it does, you get a hole in the ground. So sinkholes sometimes can form under roads, and that can be because a lot of road-based material is used uh, or made out of concrete and cement, which typically has carbonic rocks in it. So you could get a, a broken pipe that could eat away and basically simulate the same thing in nature as carbonic acid. So this is a sinkhole in Waco. And uh, these happen here, and there's several places in town that have had repetitive problems with sinkholes. But this is, they happen instantaneously. I mean, you may see some clues ahead of time. You may not. And unfortunately, not all sinkholes uh, are safe. In other words, people die. And this is an example of one near San Antonio. And there was a death associated with, with one of the people in these vehicles. And this these people had no idea. I mean, if, if they were driving at night and the sinkhole formed at night, they drove right into this, had no way to see it. These are some sinkholes in Florida. You can see how this could be devastating to human structures 
And people die in their homes in the middle of the night when they're sleeping and these things collapse. So, you know, this is something to think about where you live. And Florida is super prone to having sinkhole problems. In fact, there's a whole set of insurance issues related to not just hurricanes, but sinkholes in that area. Here's one in Florida as well. And it started off as a much smaller sinkhole and just within, you know, several weeks time it grew to look like something of this nature so if I own these houses nearby one of them I would sell in a heartbeat because once a sinkhole starts you can imagine that the ground's compromised in other areas as well disappearing streams are another type of car system and these are streams that flow for a short distance and then abruptly disappear and when this abruptly disappear thing happens, this is because you get a, a fully karsted section and the water literally makes a nosedive. What I was describing happens in Austin, San Antonio, San Marcos, and the Edwards Aquifer. That brings us to caves and caverns. There are caves that are not karst because they're caves made out of volcanic rock, all kinds of caves out there. Some actually made because people carved them out. Some are made by wind abrasion. But so a great, what is a cave? It's an underground cavity in rock. And for karst systems, they form by dissolution and disintegration of carbonate rocks like limestone. When you get very large openings, subsurface, we call these caverns, and they are different than caves because caverns are going to produce cavernous features if they are wet, meaning there is a source of water. So cave deposits happen because limestone dissolves from carbonic acid. So on the left you see some limestone and water dripping off of it. That would be an example of carbonic acid kind of eating away the fabric of that limestone. And calcite deposits will drop. And as they do, they can form cave deposits known as cave decorations. But you have to have a wet cavern for this to occur. Stalactites, and I'm going to show you a trick on knowing how to spell this. <laughs> Stalactites form when there's some kind of joint or fracture in the ceiling of a cavern and water drips down. The calcite deposits make long icicle looking type features. So they hang tight, T-I-T-E, <laughs> looking at how you spell it and use the C in front of the T, they hang tight from the ceiling. That's how we remember these. When you have a hollow stalactite, that is called a soda straw. So eventually these could turn into real stalactites that are solid. A stalagmite is when you get dripping down to the floor of a cavern, typically from a stalactite and it makes a mound on the ground. The G is for the ground, the M is for the mound. This is a stalagmite. Here are some stalactites. When you get growth of a stalactite and a stalagmite and they join or they grow really tall, that's called a column or a totem pole. These are my personal favorites. I like uh, columns and totem poles. These are some in uh, Carlsbad Caverns, and they're just stunning. So the bigger these features, the longer they've been there, and also the wetter, I might add, the cavern is, and that you've had a chance for lots of calcite deposition. Cave popcorn is when you get deposits of water in a flooded cave, and this flooded cave will put those calcite deposits on the wall, and this when the water's gone, even if it's not gone, you can start to get accumulations of those pretty easily on the side of your cavern. So cave popcorn is formed by having caverns that are wet and typically flooded out and calcite forms like almost like sweat on the sides of a cavern wall and over time it can make fairly impressive deposits like these. So most of the pictures I'm showing you of cavern deposits are from Sonora Caverns in Texas and it's the best cavern I've ever visited and extremely beautiful cavern decorations. One of the weirdest cavern deposits and I might add beautiful are holectites. So when a cavern deposit grows in multiple directions it's called this, a holectite. And the theory of how they form is that calcite-enriched groundwater from the 
carbonic acid eating away the limestone seeps through a small hole and it might even have pressure enough to spray a bit and these cause uh, crystals to form almost like you would see crystals around some type of a faucet in the winter if you had freezing. So of course they're not ice, they're calcite deposits. And I want to emphasize that all of these are calcite deposits because it's from the dissolution of limestone. There's still several more cave deposits that you can get, flowstones. I'll point out on the right, you've seen this place. This was in Yellowstone. This is the marine uh, terraces or the tra actually travertine terraces from hot, uh, Mammoth Hot Springs. And on the left, you can see the same kind of thing in a cavern in Sonora. My point is you can get marine terraces that form and curtains that form underground. And the way curtains form like this is you get a fracture or a joint and the water is flowing. So the other things I showed you were drip stones. These are flow stones. Water actually has to be moving and it has to flow in order to form something like this or this. The color differentiation has to do with uh, how the limestone is being converted and any other minerals that might be present. So see if you can name the deposit. You got it, it's a totem pole or column. These are hollow, so which one would that be? Is it a soda straw or is it a stalactite? We know it's hanging tight from the ceiling. The question is if it's hollow, and it is. So that would be a soda straw. This is where you have some kind of fracture and water is flowing down. Looks like something you might hang in your windows. They're cave curtains. Ah. What are the things hanging tight from the ceiling and they are solid? Stalactites hanging tight from the ceiling and what are the things that are mounds on the ground? Stalagmites. What are these fancy looking things? Halectites. Hanging tight from the ceiling and solid? Stalactites. The stuff that grows on the walls, when it's flooded, what do we call that? Cave popcorn. So we do conserve groundwater and try to through groundwater conservation districts. These are local entities that help manage groundwater supplies and taxes. And I want to emphasize they are not the same as TCEQ. Remember TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, cannot regulate groundwater because it's, uh, it's excluded from the definitions of waters of the state of Texas. However, the Water Development Board oversees groundwater districts and help to deal with conservation, hopefully by partnerships with industry, manufacturing, agriculture, and other citizens. And so in Texas, groundwater is ruled by right of capture not rule of capture, and that is a doctrine that supersedes everything else when we're talking about groundwater. But conservation districts are there to try to help that partnership happen so we can have an equitable use of groundwater voluntarily. Conservation matters for groundwater because if you look at the major aquifer resources on the left and you see what's happening on the right with drought conditions, you can see we've got a problem. And out west where groundwater is a very important role because there's not much surface water, our groundwater is being depleted and as drought can happens and droughts become worse, we're going to get less recharge. So the, the whole situation about climate change directly intersects here. It affects river systems, groundwater, it affects all kinds of climates such as and biomes such as glacial and deserts and eolian that you'll learn about. It's all interconnected. So we want to conserve our groundwater. This is a map showing what's happening with the vulnerability level and the redder it is, the more problematic we have. That's a direct correlation to where we're seeing the problems with droughts. And I want to emphasize groundwater must have a source of recharge in order to survive or else it can't work. And you look at this section of the Ogallala, that should be highly alarming because of the amount of crops we depend on from there. Thinking about this and what you've learned, I want you to look at the different uses of water. 
Is there an area that you could improve your usage of water? I'm not saying never to flush the toilet. I'm not saying never take a shower. I'm saying how do you use your water? Could you put a low flow shower head on? Could you maybe wash your dishes but not keep the water flowing? When you brush your teeth and wash your hands, could you not let the water run the whole time? Could you do full loads of laundry? These are all areas most of us could work on, and I would consider that maybe you would choose one thing to work on. You can make a difference. Consider using a reusable cup instead of using uh, throwaway cups, plastic cups, styrofoam cups. When you don't want water when you're dining out, refuse it. Tell people not to bring it to you. That's just wasted water. Flush off less often if you can. You can if you have kids, if you got pets that are going to drink your water. But that's a personal choice, right? But I would say that when you replace your toilet, you need to do it to code because city ordinance requires, in this area at least, to have a low flow toilet. And I would say put that low flow shower head on on your shower that will make a huge water consumption difference and fix any leaks you might have. I'm going to tell you if you do these things your water bill is going to go down too and within several tens of decades if not sooner the price of water will skyrocket and you'll appreciate these things that you're doing to make a difference. If you have any questions or concerns feel free to reach out to me because this is a topic that should start getting you a bit concerned about the future of groundwater and what that means to humans. This is a marmot moment in Glacier National Park. This marmot found somebody's cappuccino on the ground. So I guess you could kind of call it remotely groundwater. It's certainly not a seep or a spring, but something interesting to look at and to realize that humans do have an impact on wildlife. I so much appreciate your time and learning about groundwater, karst systems, and how to conserve groundwater. I'll be seeing you when we get to glaciers. Bye!